You feel like you're back in college again? No, the, the, the thing, one, one of the many, many things that is so much fun of being a part of a university, including alumni and friends and people that come visit our campus, is that we start over every September. It's like, you know, it's new and it's fresh and, and new, uh, uh, new students coming to the campus. The, the only problem that I've heard some of the faculty talking about is why have we been admitting these 12-year-olds? <laughs> each year, they, they seem to uh, look, look a little bit young each year. Uh, but this is a good year. Uh, we uh, uh, opened a year ago, you may recall, Lincoln Hall, the, the new residence hall on the east side of campus, and Lincoln Hall Dining uh, on the east side of campus. Uh, and we weren't certain last year whether it was going to be open in time. McPherson's contractors did a, did a great job of getting it open last year. Uh, uh, this year, the question was, well, will the students come back? Will this be popular? It is packed to the top. Uh, the only spaces that we have left are the ones where you can't mix men and women in the spaces. So we're about, not the gross pitch here, is we're about 98, 99% occupied in that building. It's, it's just extraordinarily popular. And we're delighted about that. Uh, it, 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 changes the dynamic on campus the more, the more students that we have here around all the time. In fact, we just had a concert <clears throat> Sunday night, Saturday football game. Anybody go to the football game? Yeah, yeah. Let's save some of those touchdowns uh, for the future. Good. Uh, but Sunday night we had, a, we had a concert, 1,100 tickets sold for the concert, a lot of excitement, a lot of people on campus doing things. And then, uh, we have, uh, I hope that you will find tomorrow uh, and uh, maybe Saturday in the newspaper, uh, there will be a report on enrollment at all of the universities uh, in Kansas, so all four-year schools, all two-year schools, and the technical schools. Uh, enrollment and recruiting students is, uh, is really competitive these days. It's not only competitive here in Kansas, but other states are recruiting students from Kansas. Of course, we're recruiting students from other states, so it's all a part of this milieu that's stirring and moving around all the time. Now, there's only about three states, maybe four states, that uh, have an abundance of students. In fact, they can't really uh, handle all the students. Florida, Texas, and California, they're turning away students. Uh, I saw Texas, University of Texas, just uh, indicated that in the past they would take uh, the top 10% of high school graduates in uh, the state of Texas. Now they've changed it to 7% because they're overwhelmed with the number of, of students. We're not quite overwhelmed, but we are making good progress. We have changed so many things in the enrollment process, in the recruiting process. You, we do not recruit students today the way we did as, as recently as five years ago. Uh, things have changed so dramatically, and the way we reach students, the way we contact them has changed so dramatically. But I can't, uh, the, the Kansas Board of Regents sequesters all of the reports from all the schools, and we're not permitted to talk about our enrollment until they make an announcement tomorrow. So pretend you didn't hear this. Uh, we, and I, I won't give the, the, the great detail in it, but. Uh, uh, we will have the largest direct from high school freshman class in the history of Washington. This so much There have been just dozens of people that have worked to make that happen, and the enrollment management team uh, has, done a, has done a phenomenal, phenomenal job. We'll also have the largest number of concurrent enrollment students that are still in high school uh, this semester. Uh, and that is a great thing for us, uh, if we believe. Uh, so there are a lot of good news that will be coming out tomorrow. Uh, we don't wish our competitors ill, but if we have more students than they do, it'll be fun, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for helping with all of that. Thank you for giving us hints occasionally about students we should contact. Thank you for sending some of your children, grandchildren, to, uh, to Washington University to continue great traditions. And if it weren't for you, this place wouldn't be, this university wouldn't be what it is today. 
your history here, your involvement, your commitment to the university, been willing to get up and come to, uh, uh, come to an event here on campus, that makes an enormous difference. You see faculty members around the room this morning, you see students around the room this morning. Uh, without you and without uh, your commitment to the university, they wouldn't be here. So thanks for what you do for Washburn. Keep coming back. Thank you, folks. Well, good morning. We are so pleased to work with the Alumni Association on, on this, although Susie was disappointed we didn't have steak and eggs this morning. Uh, we'll have to work on that uh, for, for the next time. I actually grew up in a small town in southwestern Ohio, and our claim to fame, we were the number one hog producing county in the state of Ohio. So I know a little bit about agriculture. The tallest morning of my hotel was a grain elevator. And the, the young ladies aspire to be the Clinton County Port Queen at the annual county fair. So <laughs> agriculture is an important part of my life growing up. Even, even though I, I didn't grow up on a farm, my, my grandfather had a farm. Uh, but we're glad we're going to hear about agriculture today. Um, School of Business, uh, we're, 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 we're hopping again this fall. We're, we're really excited. You know, I always report every year that, that our students take this exam when they get ready to graduate. Major field test in business. Um, and uh, I can report that last year our seniors scored about the 83rd percentile. Uh, you know, if you, if you get your statistics, that's the top 20 percent. And then our MBA students scored uh, 89th or 88th or 89th percentile, so top 11 or 12 percent. And uh, we're really proud of that because we, we don't cheat on the exams. Some of the schools do quite well on that exam. They have practice sessions and they go over the questions ahead of time and stuff like that. I simply walk in and I, I, we do cheat a little bit. I tell them they score well, I'll buy a pizza. It's, it's amazing what pizza and college, uh, what students will do, college students will do for, for some pizza. But in any case, I'm very pleased by that. Some of you that were here last year for the Wake Up series remember that we had uh, Carl Funderburger from, uh, from Topeka Rides, or the, the bicycle, uh, the, the bicycle organization here in town. You know, all the all the little rental bikes you can have. And you know, what you might not know is that uh, after the speaker speaks here this morning, they go and they talk to a couple classes. They actually work all morning long. And uh, Carl went and spoke to a couple classes and got to meet some of our one of our accounting faculty members and some of our students. And then there was, there was an issue that came up. Carl had all this data about you know, where the bikes are located and how you get them back to where they need to be and trying to measure demand and all that. And uh, three students took that on as a project. And uh, I can report that they've given, it, given him their work pro product. He loves it. There are actually, there are three other uh, cities that are interested in taking that, that, that system that they developed and seeing if they can use it in theirs. And the students that at the end of October are going off to Chicago to present a paper on their their uh, their project, and uh, so it's just a little, a little story that came I, I learned about yesterday that kind of came out from the, the wake up of the Washington Breakfast series that we have. So that's why we're so excited to uh, to be a part of it for all these many years. And I will say this: uh, while the students uh, do remain the same age, we get older. And apparently, Susie reminded me of that this morning. You can see the font size on this. <laughs> but it's my honor this morning to introduce uh, John Skelton. John earned his Bachelor of Business Administration degree in 1993. While he was a student, he was a member of the precursor of Beta Alpha Psi, an International Honor Society for Financial Information Students. Um, among his fondest memories is a wake up call he got when he took his first accounting test with Professor Walt James. If you're an accounting student of a certain age, uh, I'm sure uh, you, you, you know what he's talking about. He soon realized he needed to apply himself and go an extra mile to succeed in the class. But after graduation, John passed the CPA exam on his first try, and milestone he credits to Washburn faculty like Dr. James. Nineteen years ago, he took a risk when he left his career in public accounting to help form Innovative Livestock Services Incorporated. The result has been a successful merger and collaboration of independent companies. During this morning's lecture entitled Washburn Accounting and Cattle, John will talk about his career transformation from Washburn student to CFO of an organization that fuses together every aspect of the cattle industry. John and his wife Karen live in Lauren, Kansas and have three children. He's, he's been a Lauren City Council member and served on the boards of the Lauren Chamber of Commerce 
in the Central Kansas Medical Center. Please welcome back to Kansas, John Skelton. Topeka, 
And just a couple of days after that, I started my classes here at Washburn. That was quite a couple of weeks. All right, part of what I was asked to do here this morning was to share some things that I picked up while I was here um, and some things that maybe stuck with me that have helped me in my journey since leaving Washburn. I thought about it quite a bit. And obviously, I left Washburn with a lot more than I showed up with. Uh, but I had to boil it down to a few things. And what I decided to share might seem kind of basic, um, but they're real and they have served me well over the years. The key things that I feel like I came away from Washburn with was an understanding of hard work and what it was going to take to succeed, the significance of networking, specifically professional networking, and I came away with much improved communication skills. So hard work, networking, and communication skills. So back to those early days here at Washburn, uh, Mark guided me here and he prepped me as, as best he could, but there's some things you just have to learn on your own. And Dr. Sollers mentioned it, that wake up call uh, was one of those things I had to learn on my own. That, that test I had, it was supposed to be a review of our basic accounting classes. I'd done well, so I wasn't very worried about that test and I didn't study very hard for it. And when I got the results back, you could tell just how little I had studied for the test. Quite frankly, I bombed it. And it really shook me, it did. Um, so it became very clear to me at that point that if I wanted to have any level of success here at Washburn, I was going to have to work hard. The professors expected hard work, they encouraged hard work, and they also rewarded hard work. Now, I don't know why I'm going to do this to myself, but uh, uh, this, I guess, is an example of Dr. James rewarding some hard work. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, that guy right there, Jeff Emmerich, found this picture when he was moving earlier this year, shared it with a couple of us, so I decided I needed to share it this morning. Um, as big as we're all smiling, I'm sure this is our graduation celebration, uh, and uh, Dr. James down there in front. If you haven't found me, I'm back left there in the glasses, um, but uh, that, was, that was fun, so enough of that. <laughs> So hard work, I know there's a lot of ways to define hard work, but what I came away from Washburn with as my definition of hard work is consistent dedication. Uh, at least for me, it didn't matter here on class, uh, on campus, what class it was. Uh, I just, I couldn't get away with waiting until the last minute to prepare for a test or write a paper or complete a project. I had to be consistent with my work and I had to be dedicated enough to put in extra time when that was necessary. And if you weren't consistent with your work, chances were you might get called on in class to explain the reading for the day. And that Dr. James had a real knack for finding that person that maybe wasn't prepared, and I was not immune. I still remember the day that he looked at me and said, John, research and development costs, R&D costs, do we expense them or do we capitalize them? I had no idea. I had not done my reading, uh, wasn't prepared for class, but for some reason, I decided I had a 50 50 shot. <laughs> expense or capitalize? Expense or capitalize? Dr. James, I'll go with capitalize. That's not the right answer. And Dr. James decided not to tell me that. He instead asked me, to explain my answer. <laughs> now, he let me dig that hole a little deeper. So, no, that was not fun. It was not a fun experience, but what it was for me was one of the best lessons I got in being consistent and being dedicated in my preparation for class. And that's certainly something that has stuck with me and been beneficial for me over the years, and that's being consistent and being dedicated to things that are important to me. Now networking, that was a completely foreign concept to me when I showed up here on campus. We didn't have social networks, we didn't have social media, we didn't have Wi-Fi networks. So I just didn't have any frame of reference for what a network was, let alone a professional network. So my introduction to networking were events kind of like this where we had opportunities to meet 
other business school students, other professors. Uh, and uh, the thing was, they were in the evening, not at 7.30 in the morning. So you students that are here, kudos to you for showing up so early. Uh, but normally a local business person would come and, and share with us. And, and I, re I remember one, uh, one event where a representative from Kansas Gas and Electric came and shared with us. And he started his comments off by complaining about the good weather we were having. It was dead of winter, and we'd had a couple of weeks of really nice weather. Well, I must not have been the only one with a blank look on my face because he quickly explained to the group that good weather in the middle of winter wasn't necessarily good for the business of selling gas and electricity. So I, just one of those things I remember. So that was my introduction to networking, but networking for me uh, became real when I met uh, Dr. Baker. And actually that started with a scholarship that I got. Uh, when, I, when I first enrolled here, I told you that Karen and I were newly married, and like a lot of newly married people, we were broke. <laughs> didn't have much money, so I applied for every scholarship that I could get. Uh, and I was fortunate to get a couple, and one of them required me to take a couple of certain upper-level investment classes. I didn't necessarily need them for my degree, but I wanted that scholarship, so I enrolled in one of Dr. Baker's classes. Thing is, I loved it. I loved the subject matter, I loved the way he taught, and I must have worked hard in this class. And he must have noticed, because he ended up recommending me for a part-time job, kind of a paid internship uh, at what was then Bank 4. And that was with another Washburn alum, Dave Brandt. David's here today. Been a long time since we connected, so that was, that was fun catching up, David. Um, he was just looking for some help. Uh, at the time, I was working at Brookwood Dillon's. I was having fun there, but I was thrilled for the opportunity to work with David. He was doing municipal bond offerings and really taught me a lot in the, in the process of putting those together, uh, helped him prep for several meetings. He actually took me to some of those board meetings uh, and seeing how those uh, operations work, those organizations work, that, that was really an invaluable experience for me. Uh, David was very professional and he, he taught me a lot. And my lesson in networking continued with David. Um, one of the bond deals that we worked on involved a CPA firm out of Wichita. David knew one of the partners there, and that's where I ended up getting my first accounting job out of college. So at that point, networking was a very real, very tangible concept for me to understand. So that first job took Karen and I to Wichita. While we were here in Topeka, I told you we were newly married and broke. I mentioned that already, didn't I? Um, so while we were here, Karen worked and I finished school, so I returned the favor uh, while we were in Wichita, and Karen finished her education at Wichita State. After being in Wichita for a couple of years, after Karen had finished her, her, her education, we decided it was time to go back home to Lauren. And that baseball coach of mine, that mentor, offered me a job at his CPA firm. Uh, so we headed back home. We loved being back in Lorna. I loved working with Mark on, an, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but I'd be lying to you if I said I loved public accounting. It, it, uh, I had a lot of uh, respect for that profession. It just wasn't a fit for me. So after we were back in Lorna for a couple years, I was approached by a local businessman about coming to work for him at his cattle feed lot, and I was willing to listen to what he had to say. His offer was a little unique. He hadn't, you know, nobody had left his company. He wasn't replacing anyone. He just kept saying that he wasn't getting the financial reporting from his accounting staff that he was looking for. I said, what do you, what do you need? What are you looking for? He said, I don't know. I just, I'm not getting what I want. So I said, hey, that sounds great. Sign, sign me up. <laughs> well, the guy that hired me is, is still my boss today. And he came uh, this morning, Lee Bork, right here in, in, in the front. Uh, Lee came over from Manhattan. So thanks for making the, making the trip over. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. Lee's still the chairman of the board for our company. And we have a great time working together. 
So it was February of 1998 when I left public accounting and I went to work for Lee at Ward Feed Yard. Uh, that company at the time had one feed lot, a farming operation, and about 30 or 35 employees. And in what was very fortunate timing for me, uh, within about six or eight months of going to work there, we entered into a joint venture agreement with another local feedlot, and with them, we bought a third feedlot. And since I was still a new guy, I didn't really have much to do yet, they tasked me with monitoring the finances of this new company. And that quickly transitioned into creating benchmark financial reporting between those three companies. And that is what he was looking for. He was looking for information, not just numbers, but numbers that meant something. And I was able to provide it. I was able to communicate in a way that other people hadn't been able to. And looking back, I really think my communication skills were, were enhanced and, and developed in my time here at Washburn. When I got here, I was like most people and didn't really enjoy speaking in front of people at all. But to succeed here, there were presentations to be made and there were group projects to be completed. And at the core of that really is communication. I had to learn how to express my thoughts and my ideas, and I had to learn how to communicate with my project teammates for those to be successful as well. So my job at the feed yard quickly transitioned into really being the communicator for the company. I didn't really realize it, uh, but as I have realized it over the years, I've kind of dubbed myself the company translator. I've, I've just been able to bridge a lot of communication gaps in a lot of different situations, whereas between employees, between subsidiaries, maybe helping an attorney draft a contract for us, I've just figured out a way to effectively communicate within our company, and that has been very key for me in my development and, and growth with the company. So within five years of joining the company, we made that first joint venture followed by a few more joint ventures. And by 2006, we had kind of formed this alliance of commonly owned companies uh, that, that uh, we were co-managing. And at that point, we decided if we really wanted to take this thing to the next level, we, we needed to streamline it. So we took on the task of a big merger. Uh, and we took all those companies with all that different ownership and we formed what is now ILS. Uh, we ended up with one ownership group, one board of directors, one management team. Uh, and you talk about a lot of hard work and a lot of communication. Uh, it, it took a lot of that, but we got it done and it worked. Um, and since then, we've continued to grow uh, and make additional acquisitions. And as we sit today, I remember when I started, we had one feed lot and 30 employees. Today, we have 11 feeding facilities, 11 feed lots, and over 300 employees. We also have a large farming operation and a few other related uh, subsidiary businesses. Um, now, the cattle piece, the thing that caught Randall's attention, uh, in those 11 feed lots, we have the ability to feed 200,000 head of cattle at one time. Now feedlots are kind of like hotels. We, we'd like to keep them full all the time. That's where you make all your money is when they're, when they're full. But logistics and market economics don't allow us uh, to keep them full all the time. So our, on, a, on an annual basis, our average daily head count is about 150,000 head of cattle. They come to us as feeder cattle, which means they weigh six to eight hundred pounds. They'll stay with us four, five, six months um, until they're ready for market. Our inventory then will turn over. The cattle come in, they'll go out, they'll come in, they'll go out. And so the inventory will turn over two to two and a half times a year. So over the course of a year, we will actually feed, care for, and market somewhere 350 to 400,000 head of cattle over the course of the year, and that's where all that beef comes from. Now for a little perspective on the industry, uh, I told you we normally feed about 150,000 head of cattle. Uh, in, the, in the United States, there's a total of about 10 million head of beef cattle. 
uh, in feedlots. So we account for about a percent and a half of all the cattle in the United States. Not huge, but not insignificant either. Uh, there's a publication that tracks cattle feeding companies, and we're actually the ninth largest cattle feeding company uh, that there is in the United States. So uh, we're, we're kind of proud about that. Uh, as far as the state of Kansas, uh, Kansas is a big cattle feeding state. Of the 10 million uh, beef cattle in the United States, 2 million of those are in Kansas. We rank number three uh, when it comes to cattle feeding states. Texas is number one, Nebraska is number two. Sometimes we can get ahead of Nebraska, but typically uh, we're number three. Now in the state of Kansas, if you, if you look at all the cattle, I told you there's two million beef cattle. If you add dairy cattle and cows and calves uh, that are out on pasture, there's actually well over six million total cattle in the state of Kansas, which means there's twice as many cattle in the state of Kansas as there are people. Just a, just a fun fact there for you. <laughs> one, other, one other thing on the, on the beef industry is, uh, that you might find interesting is, is our export business. As a country, we will export almost $6 billion worth of beef around the globe each year. And Japan is our biggest export customer, and they actually take 25, 20 to 25% of all of those exports. Japan loves American beef, and we love selling it to them. Well, I'm kind of coming up on time here, and I hope it's obvious. I love my company, I love my industry, and, and I can share lots more information and lots more stories. Uh, but there's one more thing that I want to cover. Uh, before I finish up today, uh, and I've actually saved the best for last, and that is an introduction to my family. I've already introduced my wife, Karen, uh, and I joked about uh, getting married so young, and now that we have kids about that age, we really laugh about, <laughs> about, uh, about that decision, but it was a great decision for us. We've been married for 26 years now, and we have three great kids. Um, our oldest is our son Evan. He's 20. He's not married. <laughs> Evan's a sophomore on the baseball team at Friends University. Uh, Haley is 18. She's a freshman on the basketball team at Kansas Wesleyan in Salina. And our youngest, Sophia, she's a fifth grader and she's going to be 11 on Saturday. So we've got uh, we've got a birthday party coming right up. Now, I told you my college baseball career lasted all of two weeks. And with Karen and Brett both being here, they're going to tell you that Evan and Haley, all that comes from their side of the family. And I'm <laughs> not even going to argue that uh, this morning. Uh, my family is just very, very important to me. And I just had to take a minute to share them with you and make those introductions. So that's it for me this morning. I very much appreciate everyone's time and attention. And this has been fun. And it's been an honor to be here. So thank you very much. Uh, we still have some time. Let's open it up for some question and answers. Any questions from the audience?
severely unqualified for those positions. But as we grew, it was, it was a challenge to decide when can we justify hiring an IT guy? When can we justify hiring uh, an, an HR specialist? And normally you wait too long, and once you make that decision, you said, boy, I should have done that a year ago. Um, but uh, that's been a challenge, but we, the, the way that we have done that, and the way that it has come together, that's actually been one of the, one of the biggest um, uh, positives that we've had in our company, is the people that we have and the positions uh, that we have them in. We've got the people that are doing the things that they are best at, and it's been very beneficial for our company. Yes. I've got a question. Um, Kansas is uh, well aware of international trade. Our grain our sales abroad are important to the economy, and your industry is very important to the economy. Now, you understand the, uh, the intricacies of some of the treaties that we, we work with. Are you getting the kind of support from uh, our elected officials that help you grow in those international markets uh, in the way you feel it should be done? Yeah, I, I think our, our local representatives really understand the value of agriculture and the impact that that has on our state and local economies. Now, uh, the attention that gets at a national level may not be the same, and there are some risks in there and some of the things that are being talked about and some potential changes uh, that, that may happen. But from a local standpoint, uh, we feel good about the representation that we get and their understanding of, of agriculture. Yeah. Uh, can you explain a little bit about how the livestock feeding business works, the economics of it? Uh, do you own the cattle? Uh, what what uh, do you provide? How do you make money uh, out of this? And what what is the sequence of events uh, that happens uh, from the time you get them and how they go to market? Okay. Yeah. Uh, there 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 are two two scenarios. We we are a custom cattle feedlot, which means we we will accept uh, other people's cattle and just feed and care for them on a custom basis. So in that instance, we, we make our money by making and selling feed to that customer that actually owns the cattle. Uh, you might find it interesting that we actually make our feed. We, we cook corn for our feed in Kansas uh, every day. We will, we will take delivery of dry corn. We will, we will soak it at, at a high temperature. Uh, bring it up to a moisture level which will allow us to flake that corn and, and actually it turns out a lot like the cereal that you'll eat the corn flakes. Um, so we will, we will we'll make a margin on the feed that we buy, process, and then sell to those cattle. Now one of the changes in the industry that we've seen is there are far fewer people that are willing to own those cattle through the feeding process. So more and more cattle feedlots like us will actually own the cattle. So we will buy the cattle, like I said, as feeder cattle. Uh, and we are a very, very data-driven company. So we, we have a lot of performance metrics on, on how, how feed is converted to, to pounds of gain, how long it takes for the cattle to, to get ready for market. So all of those factors come into play when we make our decision uh, to buy the cattle. So they, they arrive, uh, they go through a process of uh, different feed rations that, that, that get them market ready. And as I said, that takes, depending on the size of the cattle when they arrive, somewhere four to six months. <coughs> Yes. Where are your cattle slaughtered? Well, we have a almost an exclusive arrangement with the company Tyson, and our our uh, we don't use that term anymore. We we use the term harvested. <laughs> so our cattle in Kansas go out to Garden City to the Holcomb plant, and we have feedlots in Nebraska, and there is a Tyson plant in 
Lexington, Nebraska. So those are the two main plants uh, that are market ready cattle will be harvested and processed. Yes, David. You alluded to it. Give us an example of uh, technology improvements in the industry that the uh, city suffers today with the high energy. Okay. Um, well, I think it's common knowledge that computers are everywhere, but you may not think about computers being in a feedlot, but they're everywhere. We've got them in the office, we've got them in our feed mill, we've got them in our feed trucks, we've got them in our loaders. So one of the uh, things that I, I think, I guess, would make as much sense as anything is when we make the feed for our cattle, it's a, it's a recipe. So much corn, so much hay, so much liquid supplement. And over the years, as technology has allowed from scales and connectivity to those scales, the, the precision that we are able to make our our recipes, our feed rations, has really, really gotten better. You know, we used to have a, a, a tolerance of hundreds of pounds of variance. You know, you make a 20,000 pound ration and, and, and the, the variance of corn may be measured in hundreds. Well, now it's measured in tens of pounds. We're, we're able to be much more precise uh, with, the, with the mixture of our, of our feed and, and really just the, the tracking of the animals, uh, you would be amazed at how much detail we have on the cattle performance and the treatments that the cattle receive while they're, uh, while they're at our feed lines. What, what is the, the shortage Most of that uh, goes on ground that we own, 
Uh, we've actually started uh, processing that raw manure, uh, not necessarily composting it, but we will. We have a machine that goes through a, a row of raw manure, turns it over, dries it down, and really turns it into what would look like compost. And it's a, a, a much better product. Uh, a lot of the weed seeds will be uh, uh, mitigated in that process. Uh, and, and, and it really is an effective way uh, to manage your farm ground. Now the liquid waste is, is managed through a lagoon system and that is, that is regulated by the uh, KDHE and, and uh, a lot of that gets dewatered onto our, our farm ground as well. Yes? What are some of the financial benchmarks that you implemented when you took over the third company? They were really operational measurements. The three, the three companies were, were different sizes. Uh, and what I mean by that is they, they had different capacities of cattle. But really we're trying to do the same thing. So what, what the, the biggest thing that we did was, was I created a report that, that broke down our operating expenses on a per head per day basis. So regardless of whether the feedlot has 30,000 head or 10,000 head, we were able to measure what our cowboy expense was. So how much are we spending per head per day on our cowboys at our 10,000 head yard versus a, a larger yard? And that really helped us to, to, to figure out what worked best and, and how to manage the, the finances of the, the different sizes of the feedlots as we acquired them. Yes. What percent of your employees are immigrants? Well, it depends on how you uh, define immigrant. We we do have a large Hispanic uh, uh, workforce. Uh, probably across the board, uh, we would be. 50 to 60 percent in all of our all of our companies, all of our organizations. We actually have a hard time finding labor. Uh, that's a that's a big topic uh, in our companies on a day-to-day -day basis is finding help. Cowboys specifically recently have been really really hard to find. Uh, we also have trouble finding people that are willing to put in the hours on our farm crew, and we have. Uh, we have a, 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 an arrangement where we have nine, for the last five years, we've had nine uh, South African gentlemen that have come over as, as seasonal help for us. So employment, finding good help is a, is a big challenge for us. All right. All right thank, thank you very much. You.